Live from the Javits Center in New York City, it's The Cube. Covering Inforum 2017. Brought to you by Infor. Welcome to day one of theCUBE's coverage of Inforum here at the Javits Center in New York City. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, along with my co-host, Dave Vellante. We are also joined by Jim Kobolis, who is the lead analyst for artificial intelligence at Wikibon. Thanks so much, it's exciting to be yeah, here. Yeah, good to Day see you one. again, yeah. Rebecca. It's great to, to be working Really, our here. first time, we've really we worked know. a little bit at Red Hat Summit. Exactly, but, uh, first time on the desk together. It's so. our very first time. I, I just met you a little while ago, and already yes. you're an old friend. Yeah. <laughs> so here's, you know, info, this is the third time we've done Inforum. The first time we did it was in New Orleans, and then Infor decided to skip a year, and then last year they decided to have it in the middle of July, which is kind of a strange time to have a show, but there are a lot of people here. I don't know what the number is, but it looks like you know, several thousand, maybe as many as four to five thousand. I don't know. Yeah, no, no, I feel, I feel like this is, this is a big show. It's packed for July, for Ex any month, actually. Exactly, Ex particularly at a time where we're having a lot of uh, rail issues, issues at LaGuardia, too, so it's exciting. So the, the, the Cube first met Infor at the second Amazon reInvent. And I remember the folks at Amazon told us we really have an exciting SaaS company. It's one of the, it's the largest privately held SaaS company in the world. We were thinking, is that SaaS? And they said, no, no, it's a company called Infor. We said, well, who the heck is Infor? And then we had Pam Murphy on, and that's when we first were introduced to the company. And then, of course, they, we were invited to come to New Orleans. At the time, the, the, the questions around Infor were, well, who was Infor? What are they all about? <laughs> And then it became, okay, we started to understand the strategy a little bit. For those of you who don't familiar with Infor, their strategy from the early on was to really focus on the micro verticals. We've talked about that a little bit. Just a quick bit of history. Charles Phillips, former president of Oracle, orchestrator of the M&A at Oracle, PeopleSoft, Siebel, and many others, left, started Infor, it's a roll up, gold, funded by Golden Gate Capital and other private equity, substantial base of loss in software customers, and then many, many other acquisitions. Today, fast forward, you got a, basically a almost $3 billion company uh, with a ton of debt, about $5 billion in debt, um, notwithstanding the Koch brothers' uh, uh, investment, which is almost $2.5 billion, uh, which was to retire some of the equity that Golden Gate had, some of the, 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 the owners, Charles and the three other owners, took some money off the table, but the substantial amount of the investment goes into uh, running the company. Here's what's interesting. Coke got a two-thirds stake in the company, but a 49% voting share, which implies <laughs> a valuation of about, I want to say, just under four billion. Let's call it 3.7, 3.8 billion for a two to three billion dollar company. That's not a software company with 28% operating margin. That's not a huge valuation. So we'll ask Charles Phillips about that. I mean, it's some of this wonky stuff and the financials, you know, we want to get through. I'm sure Infor doesn't want to talk too much about that. Um, but it is true, it is one of, it is, uh, for a unicorn, for a privately held company, this is, um, this, this is one of them. This is up there with Uber and Airbnb. Um, and it's a question that why, why isn't it valued at, at more? Well, I think my only assumption here is they went to Coke and said, okay, here's the deal. We want you know, $2 billion plus. You only get 49% only. If you get 49% of the company in terms of voting rights, we'll give you two thirds in terms of ownership. It's a sweetheart deal. Of course, it's a lot of dough. You get a board seat, maybe two board seats, I can't remember. And we'll pump this thing up, we'll build up the equity, and we'll float it someday in the public markets and we'll all make a bunch of dough. And our shareholders will all be happy. That's the only thing I can assume was the sort of conversation that went on. We'll, again, we'll ask Charles mm -hmm. Phillips, see if he, he answers that. But James, you sat in yesterday at the analyst event. Um, you got sort of the history of the company and uh, you know, the fire hose of information leading up to what was announced today, Coleman AI. What were your impressions as an analyst? Well, first of all, my first impression was a thought, a question. Um, is Infor with Coleman AI simply playing catch up in a very, I would call it like a war of attrition in the ERP space. It's really, it's four companies now. It's SAP, it's Microsoft, it's Oracle, and it's Infor duking it out. SAP, Microsoft, and Oracle all have fairly strong AI capabilities and strategies and investments, and clearly they're infusing. I was at Microsoft built a few months ago. They're infusing those capabilities into all of their offerings. So, 
With Coleman, sounds impressive, though it's just an early announcement. They've only begun to trickle it out to their, their vast suite. Um, I want to get a sense, and probably later today we'll talk to, I think, uh, Mr. Ango, Duncan Ango. I want to get a sense for how does, or does, um, Infor intend to differentiate their, their suite in this fiercely competitive ERP war. How, does, how will Coleman enable them to differentiate it? Right now it seems like everything they're announcing about Coleman is great in terms of digital assistance, you know, conversational interface, everybody does this too now, you know, with uh, chat bots and so forth, in line providing recommendations and kind of, everybody's doing that, essentially, everybody wants to go there. How are they going to stand apart with those capabilities, number one? Um, number two, just the, you know, the, the timeline. How, they have this vast suite, and we just came from the keynote where, you know, Charles and the other uh, execs laid out in minute detail the micro vertical application. What is their timeline for rolling out those Coleman capabilities throughout this week so customers can realize that value? And is, and is there a layered implementation? They talked about augmentation versus automation versus assistance. I'd like to see sort of a layer of capabilities in, a, in, a, in, a, in an architecture with a sense for how they're going to invest in each of those capabilities. For example, they talked about open source, like with TensorFlow, which is a new deep learning framework from that, well, Google open source. Um, I just want to get a, a, a deep dive into wh where the investment funds that they're getting from Coke and others, especially from Coke, where that's going in terms of driving innovation going forward in their portfolio. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not, I'm not uh, cynical about it. I think they're doing some really interesting things but I want some more meat on the bones of their strategy. Well, it's interesting because I think they came into, Infor came into the show wanting to message innovation. And they're not known as an innovative company, uh, but you heard Charles Phillips up there talking about today, he was talking about quantum computing, he was talking about the end of Moore's Law, yeah. he was obviously talking about AI. You know, they've named, they named Coleman after Katherine Coleman Johnson. Yeah. Uh, and so, Here's you know, my speculation. My speculation, they, of course, they recently completed the acquisition of Burst. P P Brad Peters did a really good discussion of Burst, the BI uh, you know, uh, startup that's come along real fast. My sense, and I want to get confirmation, is that possibly Burst and Brad Peters and his team, will, will they drive the Coleman strategy going forward? It seems likely because Burst has some AI assets that Brad Peters brought us up to speed on yesterday. I want to get a sense for how Burst AI and Coleman AI are going to come together into a convergence. Well, wouldn't they say that it's a quote unquote embedded, embedded, yeah, embedded. AI, you know, buried within be, yeah. the software suite. We saw, like you said, in gory detail, the, the application portfolio that, that Infor had. I mean, I think one of the challenges the company has, it's like some of my staff meetings, not everything is relevant <laughs> to everybody. Yeah. And so, um, they, but, but very clearly they have a lot of capabilities that most people aren't aware of. So, the question is, is, how much can they embed AI across those, and where are the use cases, and what's the value? Yes. Um, and it's early days, right? Oh yeah, very much. And you know, in some of those applications, probably many of them, the automation capabilities that they describe for Coleman be just as important as the human augmentation capabilities. You know, in other words, micro-verticalize their AI in, in diverse ways going forward across their portfolio. In other words, one. Uh, AI brush, you know, just you know, broad brush of AI across every application probably won't make sense. The applications are quite, quite different. I want to talk about the use cases here and, and it, the selling points for these things are making the right decision yeah. uh, all the time, more quickly. Productivity uh, accelerators for knowledge workers, all that. And, yes. and one of the other points that was made is that there are fewer arguments because we are all looking at the same data yeah. and we trust the data. Where do you see uh, Burst and Coleman? Which in, uh, Give me an example of where you could see this potentially transforming We all trust data. Actually, we don't all <laughs> trust data because the, all, not all data is created the same. Burst comes into the portfolio not just through you know, really great visualizations and dashboarding and so forth, but they've got a well-built out data management back end for data governance and so forth to cleanse the data. Because if you have dirty data, you can't derive high quality decisions from the data. Excellent first, point, right. First of all, right. yeah. So, um, that's really my, my general take on uh, you know, where it's going. In terms of the burst, I think the burst acquisition will become pivotal in terms of them taking their data driven functionality to the next level of consumability. Because burst has done a really good job of making their capability consumable for the general knowledge worker audience, so. Well, a couple things, so actually let me frame, Charles Phillips I thought did a good job framing the strategy, sort of his strategy stack, if you will, starting with, at the bottom of the stack, the micro verticals strategy, and then moving up the next layer was their decision to go all cloud, AWS cloud. 
The third was the network. Uh, Infor made an acquisition of a company called GT Nexus, which is a commerce platform that has 18 years of commerce data and transaction data uh, there. And then the next layer was analytics, which is Burst. And I'll come back to that. And then the, the top layer is Coleman AI. The, the Burst piece is interesting because we saw the ascendancy of Tableau yeah. and its land and expand strategy. And Kristen Chabot, the CEO of Tableau, used to talk about, and, and, and they said this yesterday, the, the slow BI, you know, cubes and the, the cycle of, you know, the life cycle of actually getting an answer. By the time you get the answer, the market has changed. And that's what Tableau went after. And Tableau did very, very well, but it turned out Tableau was largely a desktop tool. Yeah. Wasn't available in the cloud, it is now. Uh, and it had its limitations. It was ba basically a visualization tool. So, so what Infor has done with Burst is they're positioning the old Cognos, which is now IBM, yes. Yes. And, and you know the micro strategies of the world as the old guard. Yes. They're position they're depositioning Tableau, uh, and they didn't use that specific name Tableau, yes. but that's what they're talking about, Tableau and Click, as less than functional, <laughs> sort of spreadsheet plus. <laughs> and they are now the rich, robust platform that both scales and has visualization and has all the connections into the enterprise software world. So I thought it was interesting positioning. Would love to, to talk to some customers and see you know, what that really looks like. But that essentially was the strategy stack that Charles Phillips laid out. And I guess the last point I'd make is I come back to the decision to go AWS. You saw the application portfolio those are hardcore enterprise apps, which everybody says don't live in the cloud. Well, 55% of Infor's revenue is from the cloud. Right. So clearly, it's not true. A lot of these apps are becoming oh, yeah. cloud enabled. Most of them. Most of them? Most of them uh, are. All of them? Yeah, most okay, it's BI, not, it's most not, predictive analytics, most AI, you know, uh, you know machine so, learning is going in the cloud. Because Oracle's the argument cloud? is Oracle will be the only one who can put those apps the in the data lives in the cloud. And, and it, it's trained on the data. Not all the data it's like lives GT in the cloud. Nexus, that's EDI, that's rich EDI data. As they've indicated, for training this new generation of neural networks, machine learning and deep learning models, continuously from fresh transaction data, you know that that's where GT Nexus and the e-commerce network fits into this overall strategy. It's a massive pile stream of data for but, mining. But you know, SAP has struggled in the cloud. You know, success, success factors obviously is their SaaS play, but you know, most of their stuff remains on-prem. Yeah. Oracle again claims they are the only end-to-end -end hybrid. You see Microsoft finally you know, shipping Azure Stack, or at least claiming to soon be shipping Azure Stack. Okay, that's, they've obviously got a strategy there with their productivity estate. Uh, but here you have Infor. And don't forget IBM. They've got a very rich hybrid well, you portfolio. Heard, I don't know if it was Charles, somebody took a uh, swipe at IBM today saying that they, the companies have, our competitors have purchased all these companies, these SaaS companies, and they don't have a way to really stitch them together. Well, that's not totally true. Blue Mix is IBM's way. Although, that's been a heavy lift. We saw with Oracle Fusion, it took over a decade, and that's, they're still working on that. So, so in for, again, I, I want to talk to customers and find out, okay, how much of this claim that everything's sort of you know, seamless in the cloud is actually true? I think obviously a large, portion of the install base is still that legacy on-prem Lawson base that hasn't modernized. And that's always, in my view, been enforced big challenges. How do you get that base, leverage that install base to move and then attract new customers? You know, by all accounts, they're doing a pretty good job of it. Hmm. I, don't think there's a, I don't think what's going on, I don't think, I don't think a lot of lift and shift is going on. Legacy Lawson customers are not moving in droves to the cloud I mean, with their data and all that. There's not a massive lift and shift. It's all the new greenfield applications for these, these new use cases, uh, you know, in terms of predictive analytics. That's, they're, they're being born and living their entire lives in the cloud. And a know? lot of HR, a lot yeah. of HCM, obviously. Yeah. You know, competing with Workday and, yeah. and PeopleSoft. That's, that stuff's going into the cloud. Yeah. So, you know, we're going to be unpacking this uh, all, all day today uh, and tomorrow, uh, two days indeed, here of coverage. Yes, indeed. And, uh, yeah, excited to be here. It, it's going to be it's going to be a great show. Bruno Mars is is performing the Bruno final Mars. day. I know. Very you know what company's doing good in for when they can <laughs> pay for the likes of a Bruno Mars so who's true. still having mega hits on the radio. I wish I was staying long enough to catch that one. I know, indeed, indeed. <laughs> well, for Dave and Jim, I'm Rebecca Knight. We'll be back with more from Inforum 2017 just after this.